Giambala Basil, The Merchant's Two Sons, from 1634. Page 39. There was once a very rich merchant called Antoniello, who had two sons, Cienzo and Mio, so much alike that you could not tell one from the other. Now it happened that Cienzo the Elder, having challenged the King of Naples' son to a battle of stones at the Anoracia, broke the prince's head. Antoniello, in a fury at this incident, said to his son, Bravo, now you've done a fine thing. Publish it abroad. Boast of it, you windbag, or I will rip you. Put it on a perch where all can see it, for you have broken something worth six grani. You have broken the head of the king's son. Didn't you have the cane to measure your distance, you goat son? Now what will happen to you? You've cooked up your goose so well that I wouldn't wager three cali on you. Even if you could creep back into what you came out of, I couldn't save you from the long arm of the king, for you know that it reaches everywhere. He will do something terrible. His father talked, and at last Cienzo replied, My good sir, I have always heard that it is better to have the court than the doctor in the house. Wouldn't it have been worse if he had broken my head? We are only boys. I challenged and we fought. It is a first offense. The king is a reasonable man. And after all, what can he do to me? Let him who will not give me the mother give me the daughter. Let him who will not send me cooked meat send me raw meat. There is a whole world open to us and let him who fears become a constable. What can he do to you, replied Antoniello? He can send you for a change of air, send you packing out of this world. He can make you a schoolmaster where you have a birch 24 feet long to thrash the fishes with till they learn to speak. He can send you off to marry the widow in a well-starched collar three feet wide, but instead of touching the lady's hand, you will feel the hangman's foot. So don't stay here at the risk of your life between the cloth and the tailor's scissors, but be off this very moment, and let nothing fresh or old be heard of your doings. And if you don't want to get caught by the foot, the bird in the field fares better than the bird in the cage. Here in some money for you. Take one of the two enchanted horses that I have in the stable, and a dog which is also enchanted, and delay no longer. It is better to take your heels than to feel the heels of another. Better to put your legs to your shoulders than to find two legs round your neck. Better to run a thousand feet than wait here for three feet of rope. Take yourself off with your knapsack at once for not even the lawyers Baldo and Bartolo can help you. Cienzo asked his father's blessing, mounted his horse, and carrying his dog under his arm, rode out of the city. But when he had passed through the Capuan Gate, he turned to look back and began to say, Ah, my beautiful Naples, behold, I am leaving you, and who knows if it will be my lot ever to see you again, whose bricks are of sugar, whose walls are of sweet pastry, where stones are manna, the rafters are sugar canes, and the doors and windows wafer canes. Oh, woe is me! Now that I am leaving you, my beautiful penino, I feel as if setting forth with the pennant. My spirit sinks as I leave you, Piazza Larja, and I feel I lose my very soul as I say farewell to you, Piazza del Olmo. Parting from you, Lancieri, is to be pierced by a Catalan lance. Tearing myself from you, Fosella, my spirit is torn from the pit of my soul. Where shall I find another Porto? 
though beautiful port of the whole world's wealth, where another galaxy, where the silkworms of love continually weave cocoons of pleasure, where another per suo, the resort of all virtuous men, where another logia, where plenty is lodged and pleasure is refined. A lavinaro, I cannot tear myself from you without a lava of tears streaming from my eyes, nor from you, Mercado, without a load of grief as merchandise. Beautiful Piagia, I cannot leave you without a thousand wounds tormenting my heart. Farewell parsnips and beetroots, farewell fritters and cakes, farewell cauliflower and pickled tuna fish, farewell tripe and liver, farewell mincemeat and grated cheese, farewell flowers of cities, glory of Italy, painted egg of Europe, mirror of the world, farewell Naples, the non plus ultra, where virtue has set her limits and grace her boundaries. I leave you and shall be deprived of your cabbage soups driven out of this dear village. Oh, my broccoli, I must leave you behind. So saying, and making a winter of weeping in that summer of sighs, he journeyed forward till the end of the first day. Nearing on Cascano, he reached a wood which enjoyed both silence and shade, while the sun held its mule without confines. There he found a tumble-down old house at the foot of a tower. He knocked at the door of the tower, but the master was afraid of robbers, and it was already night, and refused to open. So poor Cienzo was obliged to stay in the old ruin, and having tethered his horse in the middle of the field, threw himself down to sleep on a little straw which he found inside, and the dog beside him. He had no sooner closed his eyes and was falling asleep than he was roused by the barking of the dog and the clattering of old shoes in the house. Cienzo, who was bold and venturesome, put his hand to his sword and struck up fiercely in the dark, but finding that with his wild aim he hit no one, he lay down again on the straw. After a while he felt his feet being gently pulled up reached for his sword and got up again, calling out, Ho there, now you've really annoyed me. There's no sense in playing these tricks. If you have any pluck, you'll show yourself and let's have it out together, for you will find you met your match. In answer to this came a side-splitting laugh, and then a deep voice said, Come down here and I will let you know who I am. Cienzo, without losing courage, replied, Wait a bit, I am coming. He groped around and found a ladder into the cellar. Where he'd gone down there, he saw a light lamp and what there appeared to be three goblins and were making a pitiful lamentation, calling out, Oh, my beautiful treasure, must I lose you? Cienzo thought that he had better join in the hullabaloo for the sake of good fellowship. He did so for some time, and the moon had already cleaved the bar of heaven with the axe of her rays when three who had been chanting the dirge said to him, Now go and take this treasure which is destined for you alone, but take care to guard it well. Then they suddenly disappeared, just as if they were the fellow you never see. Cienzo, seeing sunlight through a hole, wanted to climb up again out of the cellar, but he could not find the ladder. So he began to shout, and shouted so loudly that the master of the tower, who had come within those ruined walls to perform an act of nature, heard him and asked what he was doing there. And when Cienzo told him what had happened, he went to fetch a ladder and came down into the cellar. As soon as he reached the bottom, he saw before him a great treasure of which he at once took possession. But not without offering Cienzo his proper share. Cienzo refused it, however, and taking his dog in his arms, he got on his horse and set out on his journey. Um, 9.58, what does that mean? I don't know what 9.58 is. Jesus. Okay, let's just go. Ah. <sighs>
threw himself down to sleep on a little straw which he found inside his dog beside him. After a few hours, he came to a lonely, desolate forest so gloomy that it made one shudder with fright. Here on the bank of a river, which to please the shadows, it loved wound snake-like through the meadows, leaping over stones. He found the fairy surrounded by a band of robbers who were trying to deprive her of her honor. Cienzo, as soon as he saw the evil intentions of these miscreants, drew his sword and made shambles of the band. This fairy overwhelmed him with her compliments and thanks for what he had done in her defense and invited him to a palace nearby where she would reward him for his services. But Sienzo replied, Oh, that was nothing at all. A thousand thanks, but I am in great haste now and on important business. I must accept your favors at some other time. And he went on his way. Well, when he had traveled along another long stretch, he found himself before the king's palace, all hung with mourning drapery, which made one's heart grow dark to see it. Cienzo inquired the meaning of this mourning and was told that there had appeared in the country a seven-headed dragon, the most terrible that had ever been seen in the world, with the crest of a cock, the eye head of a cat, the eyes of fire, the jaws of a race hound, the wings of a bat, the claws of a bear, and the tail of a serpent. Now this dragon, they told him, swallows a Christian every day, so that it has gone up till today, when now lots fallen upon the king's daughter, Menachella. That is the reason of the distress and mourning in the royal palace, for the fairest lady of the land is to be swallowed and devoured by this horrible beast. When Cienzo had received this information, he stood aside and saw Menachella approaching in a morning procession, accompanied by the court ladies and all the women of the country, wringing their hands, tearing out their hair by handfuls, and bewailing the unfortunate princess, crying out, Who could have thought that this maiden would give up the joyous light of inside this beautiful silkworm, who would left the seed of its vital statement in a black cocoon? While they were thus lamenting, yo, out came a dragon from the depths of a great cavern. Oh, mother my, how hideous it was. The sun for terror hid behind the clouds, the sky darkened, and the hearts of all the folk became mummified. So great was their trembling that it would have been impossible to pierce them with a paste bristle. Cienzo, at this sight, rushed forward and whizzed with a blow of his sword, fell down one of their heads. But the dragon rubbed his neck on a plant, which was growing close by, and immediately the head reattached itself, just as a lizard joins itself on at the tail. Cienzo thought to himself, without perseverance, there will be no offspring, and clenched his teeth, giving such a tremendous blow that he cut off all seven heads at once and they leapt from the dragon's neck like peas out of the uh, frying pan. And he tore out all the tongues and put them in his pocket and rolled the heads a mile away from the body lest they might be reunited with him. He gathered a handful of the plant which the dragon had joined his head on again to his neck. When this was done, he sent Menenchela back to her father's house and went off to rest himself in an inn. No words can describe the king's joy on seeing his daughter again. When he heard in what manner she had been freed, he ordered a proclamation to be made that so whosoever killed the dragon should come and claim the princess for his wife. Now, a rascally peasant, when he saw the proclamation, collected all the dragon's heads, took them to the king, and said, It was the deed of the man you see before you that saved Menenchela. These are the hands that freed the country from destruction. Behold the dragon's heads, which are proof of my valor. Therefore, promise the duty will be fulfilled. 
and the king took the crown from his own head and put it on the rustic's paint, which now looked like the head of a bandit on the top of a pole. The news of these doings soon spread abroad and reached the ears of Cienzo, who said to himself, Really, am I a great fool? I held fortune by the hair of her head and have let her slip through my hands. One man offers half a fortune, and I make more of it than a German would of glass of a cold water. Nothing. A fairy offers me her favors in her palace, and it means to me no more than does music to an ass. Now I have the chance of a crown, and stand here like a tipsy woman with her spindle, letting hairy-footed swindlers get before me with and cheat me out of my ace of trumps. With these reflections, he took a pen from the inkstand, spread out a sheet of paper, and began to write as follows to the most beautiful jewel of all women, Menencella, the daughter of Perdenseno. Having by grace of soul in Leo saved your life, I learn another claims my deeds and the service I did as his own. But you, who were presented at the fray, can assure the king of the truth and will not allow the vacant place for which I have labored to be taken by another. Thus shall your queenly graciousness have its due effect and the strong hand of Scanabecos its well-deserved reward. In conclusion, I kiss your dainty hands, dated in a, the Oranel today, Sunday. Cienzo, having written his letter and sealed it with a wafer, put it in his dog's mouth and said to him, Now go, run fast, and carry it to the king's daughter. Give it only into the hands of the silver-faced maiden. The dog arrived at the palace almost as quickly as if he had flown, went up the stairs, and found the king still paying compliments to the bridegroom. And he, seeing the dog come in with the letter in his mouth, ordered that it should be taken from him. But the dog would not allow anyone to touch it, but jumped into Manchella's lap and put the letter in her hand. Manchella rose from her seat, made a curtsy to the king, and handed him the letter to read. When the king had read the letter, he at once ordered that the dog should be followed to see to what house it would go to, and the dog's master should immediately be brought before him. Two of the courtiers followed the dog, came to the inn, where they found Cienzo, and where they had delivered their message, brought him back to the palace. When Cienzo arrived in the royal presence, the king asked him how he dared boast of having killed the dragon. When the seven heads had been brought by the man now sitting beside him with a crown on his head. To which Cienzo replied, that fellow deserves a cardboard mitre instead of a crown for his impudence in telling you such false tales. And so that I may prove it was I who did the deed and not this bearded goat, Order the dragon's head to be brought here. Not one of them can bear witness, for not one has a tongue, and all the tongues I have brought with me to judgment, so that they may bear witness. He showed them the tongues, and the rustic was utterly dismayed and could not think of what had happened. Then Manchella called out, This is the man. Oh, you wretched dog, what a trick you played me. The king immediately took the crown from a thick-headed rustic, and put it on Cienzo's head. He would have sent the man to the galleys, but Cienzo, repaying wickedness with kindness, begged and obtained his pardon. Then the tables were spread, and there was a great feast, after which the bride and the bridegroom were tried to a beautiful bread, all fragrant with fresh linen, where Cienzo, having carried off the trophies of his victory over the dragon, triumphantly entered the citadel of love. When morning came and the sun, brandishing light's two-handed sword amidst the stars, called out, Back, you rabble! Cienzo, who was dressing in front of the window, saw a beautiful girl at the opposite window. 
Who is that lovely girl who lives in the opposite house? Asked Cienzo, turning to Menchella. And what do you want with that rubbish? Replied his wife. Why are you staring at her? Have you some foolish idea come into your head? Or are you surfeited with good things? Isn't meat you have at home good enough for you? Cienzo hung his head like a cat caught thieving and said not a word, but pretended to go out of the room for something. He left the palace and went to the house of a beautiful girl. She really was a dainty morsel, like a soft cream cheese or sugar cake. She never turned the pupils of her eyes without branding some heart with messages of love. She never opened the cauldron of her lips without scowling some heart, and she never moved her foot without giving the final blow to the shoulder of some poor wretch who hung suspended by the court of hope. But beside all these bewitching charms, she had the power, when she wished, of enchanting, binding, fastening, knotting, enchaining, and entangling men with her hair. And she did so to Cienzo, who, as soon as he set foot in the house, was caught and tethered like a young colt. While all these things were happening, Mio, the younger brother, not having any news of Cienzo, began to think he would go in search of him. He obtained permission of his father and also received an enchanted horse and an enchanted dog. He started on his journey and arrived one evening at the tower where Cienzo had been. The master, mistaking him for his brother, was most kind to him and wanted to give him the handsome present of money, which Mia would not accept. But all these attentions made him think that his brother must have been there, which gave him hope of finding him. As soon as the moon, the enemy of poets, had turned her back on the sun, he started again on his way and came to the palace of the fairy, who also took him for Cienzo and received him joyfully, saying, Welcome, my friend, who saved my life. Meow thanked her for her kindness but said, Forgive me for not saying now. I am in great haste. Farewell till we meet again on my return. Delighted at always finding traces of his brother, he continued his journey and arrived at the king's palace the very day that his brother had been captured by the witch's heir. She entered the palace and was received by the servants with great honor and was affectionately embraced by the bride who said, Welcome, my husband. Day is past, and every bird goes out to seek food, yet the owl returns. Why are you so late, my Cienzo? How can you stay away so long from your menancella? It took you me out of the dragon's jaws, but you thrust me back into a dark gullet of suspicion when your eyes are not mirrored in mine. Mio, who was crafty, it's at once that this must be his brother's wife. He embraced her and excused himself for being late, and they sat down and dined together. So when the moon, like a brood hen, called the stars to pack up the dewdrops, the two retired to bed. But Mio, who respected his brother's honor, divided the sheets to avoid touching Mencha, taking one for himself and leaving the other for her. Manchella, this strange proceeding, with scowling looks and the face of a stepmother, said, Goodness me, what's all this about? What are we playing at? What sort of a joke is this? Are we two quarreling peasants that have some boundaries marked out? Are we armies attached to a trench that must be dug? Are we wild horses that you put up a palisade? Neo, who couldn't count to thirteen, replied, do not be angry with me, beloved, but with the doctor who has ordered me to diet, wishing to purge me. Beside, I've come back worn out with the fatigue of a whole day's hunting. Manchella, who knew not how to trouble water, swallowed this story and went to sleep. But when night, exiled by sun, was helped of hours of twilight to pack her bundles, Mio began to dress himself before the window, as his brother had done. He saw the same beautiful girl who had captivated Cienzo, 
and since he also found her pleasing, he said to Menoncella, Who is that coquette at the window? And she said, in a great rage, answered, Now is who is that? Now it is beginning again. Yesterday, too, you made a song about an ugly wretch. I fear the tongue goes where the tooth hurts. You ought to show me more respect, for I am a king's daughter, and all dung has its own order. There was some reason for your playing the Imperial Eagle this night, shoulder to shoulder. Not without a purpose have you retired with your capital. I understand you. Dieting in my bed means banqueting elsewhere. If I find this out, for certain I shall do something violent, and chips will be sent flying through the air. Mio, who had eaten bread out of more than one oven, calmed her with her fair words. He assured her on his oath that he would not change her for the most beautiful courtesan in the world, and that she was the apple of his eye. Menoncella, quite consoled, went to her dressing room for waiting maids to pass the glass over her forehead, dress her hair, tint her eyelashes, color her cheeks, and adorn her in every way so that she might appear more beautiful to the man she thought was her husband. In the meanwhile, Mio, suspecting that from what Mancella had said, that Cienzo must be in the beautiful girl's house, took his dog, left the palace, and went into the opposite house. No sooner had he arrived than the beautiful witch said, Hair on my head, bind this man. But Mio promptly called, Eat up this woman, my dog. Whereupon the dog flew at her and swallowed her down like the yolk of an egg. Meow then went right into the house and found his brother under a spell. But he took two of the dog's hairs and put them on Senzo, who then woke as if from a deep sleep. Meow began to tell Senzo what had happened on his journey, and lastly at the palace, and how he had slept with Menchella because she mistook him for his brother. And she would have gone on to speak of the divided sheets when Cienzo, moved by the devil, seized an old sword and cut off his brother's head as if it had been a cucumber. The king's daughter, hearing the disturbance, rushed in and saw Cienzo had killed the man exactly like himself. When she asked his motive, Cienzo replied, Ask yourself, you have slept with my brother thinking it was I. That is why I killed him. Alas, how many are wrongfully slain? exclaimed Minchella. This is a fine thing you have done. You do not deserve such a good brother. Now you shall know what happened. When he found himself in the same bed with me, with great modesty, divided our sheets, saying, You keep to your side, and I will keep to mine. Cienzo repented bitterly for his terrible mistake, which had been born of a hasty judgment, and had become a father to foolish deed. And he tore the skin from his face, but recollecting the plan he had seen the dragon use, he rubbed it on his brother's neck, and immediately the head was joined on again, and the brother stood up alive and well. He embraced him with joy and begged for forgiveness for having given way to anger, and then they all went back to the king's palace. Antoniello was sent for and came with all his family, and he became a very dear friend of the king, and what happened to his son saw the truth of the saying, Tis the crooked ship goes straight to port.